Alright, a bunch of you on IRC have been taking a bit of an interest in amateur radio, and Mustang and I, as well as a few others in IRC, are, are licensed amateur radio operators. Now, we do want to start getting into a bit of amateur radio because it is cool technology, and a lot of us like to just dick around with, a lot of us like to dick around with, with tech and see how far we can push it. So, uh, how did amateur radio start? Well, amateur radio, uh, I believe it started somewhere around 1920. I don't remember the exact date, but it, it's been around a lot longer than that. Uh, it's just basically people that they, they didn't do it professionally. They did it for a hobby. They messed around with radio, and through the years, they've tried. They, they've pushed the envelope so far, trying all different kinds of things. I mean, you think just radio, you know, just voice communications over a staticky radio, but there really there's a lot more a lot to of, it. A lot of it. times when people when people think amateur radio, it's just two fat truck stop CB guys talking about their monkey wrench and all that crap. But there's actually a really big community behind amateur radio. Uh, one of the primary reasons to get into amateur radio is to set up emergency communications when the shit has hit the fan, which in recent dates has shit has hit the fan. You know, we've had a lot of bad weather. Um, Aphidian. Aphidian does a lot of uh, emergency amateur radio stuff. Um, I'm involved with the amateur radio emergency services myself. Uh, amateur radio was, uh, was actually designed as a private sector of military emergency communication. So when the military needs aid, if they don't have communications, civilians can step in when an emergency arises and we can do something about it. But the 99% of the time when there's no emergency, you just talk to pretty cool people, do some practice, prepare yourself for emergency. That's the thing about amateur radio. It, the, the redundancy factor in it, you know, everybody nowadays they think, oh, what do I need an amateur radio for? I get a cell phone, I get a page, or whatever. Those all depend on a network, whereas the amateur radio can connect to networks, but you also have simplex, where it's just radio to radio. You're not relying on a third person. So if you have a generator, you have batteries, you have over energetic kids and or craft you've putting together generators, whatever, you can power, you can power your radios when nobody else has got electricity, nobody else has got any other form of communication. Yep, I mean, and you know, not only that, you know, why do you need IRC? Why do you need Instant Messenger? Why do you need your Facebook or your MySpace? You, you use these as tools to communicate to people that you normally wouldn't see face-to-face -face in real life. There are a lot of amateur radio events where people will actually get together in a convention like we do with BSOD meetups and 2600 meetups and all that other shit. And people will get together and they'll just geek out with amateur radio. Now, if you want to get involved with amateur radio, it's really not difficult. There are no drawbacks to not having your amateur radio license. You can go to qrz.com, we'll put a link in the show notes, possibly on the screen, and you can take practice exams. Now, the practice exams are actual questions, I think it's what, 100 or 150 questions uh, total, but you'll only get asked. No, I the, think, pool, the pools, I think it's around 400, but the, the question base is what, 35 now? Yeah, you'll only, if for, your, for your entrance exam, a technician class license, you will only be asked 35 of those possible questions. A lot of the questions are bureaucratic crap about what forms you have to fill out, or just scenarios of like, you know, what frequency is UHF, what frequency is VHF. Take the test, and when you can pass it like five times in a row, with at least an 85 percentile or higher, wait a couple of days, and then take it again to see if you pass it. Just memorize all the answers. Now, a lot of times people think, oh, that this is cheating, it's not amateur radio. But to tell you the truth, I have never encountered any of those questions in real life. It's pretty easy. Now, to get your actual license, you're going to have to find a local amateur radio group, which isn't too hard. QRZ.com. Is it .com or .net? I think it's .com. We'll put a link up on the yeah. screen if we fucked it up. You can actually um, you can actually put in your state, and they'll actually tell, show you all of the active amateur radio groups. A lot of them you are can, very friendly. Uh, you can go to AR... ARRL, Amateur Radio Relay League, and they'll have a list of local groups in your area. A lot of times they'll meet up like once a month, and they'll have a formal meeting. They'll talk about, you know, whatever that group does. Like my local group, we do we do field days where we'll go out and we'll, we'll borrow each other's equipment. We'll set everything up in like a picnic area, and we'll communicate all around the world because, we, you know, amateur radio equipment can get kind of expensive. Uh, Mustang and I have... Yesu FT60s, which are really good first-time handheld amateur radios, but it's 250 bucks. That's a lot of money to invest on something that you might not be interested in. So even if you don't have a license, you can go to the amateur radio group, and they can get you started. They, you can operate under someone else's license as long as they supervise you. So you know we've got Ugster behind the camera. He can hop on my radio right now. Unfortunately, it's my ass on the line if he decides to be a douche. Now so. my suggestion, like like Fox mentioned, the Radios cost about $250, they're expensive. My suggestion is, first, see if you like amateur radio. Go get your license. If you have a friend that has a radio, use theirs for a little while. Go, go to club meetings, you can use their radios or field day events. And if you don't have, if you don't have uh, the opportunity to use a ra someone else's radio, 
Uh, you can jump on Echo Link. You can download it on your computer. It kind of kills the redundancy of amateur radio, but it's it's like VNC pretty much. I, yeah. That's the best way to describe it. What, what someone will do is they'll actually hook their radio into their computer, and you can log into their computer, and it's kind of like voice over IP, like Skype or whatever you use, with VNC put together so you can control their radio over the internet and talk on their radio from over the internet. And that's another thing. We have repeaters. Repeaters are like IRC networks where, you know, some Joe Schmo group, whatever, you know, you just got some equipment left over, you got a spare co controller, and we have a repeater. From New York City, I've actually gone as far out as this, uh, the western side of Pennsylvania, 290 miles. Uh, Mustang, how far away are you from me? I'm about 100 miles away, but on the network that, that he talks to me on, I can we I can hit people so I know he can all the way down almost by Washington DC I believe. Yeah, we can go down to Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, parts of New York City, upstate New York, most of Pennsylvania. And these are all linked together with just one repeater network. So repeaters are set up by amateur radio operators for amateur radio operators to just get messages across. There's a lot of protocol and, you know, lingo just like there is on AIM and IRC and everything else. Basically each each repeater you get on sit there and listen for a while before you jump into the conversation. Because with amateur radio, there really isn't a real strict set of rules. Every area you go to has a different set of rules. The rules are designed by the people that use it. Some areas, they're more strict about what topics, like uh, some repeaters, they don't like you talking about politics or anything that's controversial. I've listened in to the local repeater that he's on, and you can talk about anything there, and they do, and it's actually interesting. Whereas down by my house, it's more of a... Uh, contest of who's got the bigger antenna. Yeah, they're pretty stuck up down there. But I mean, really, it depends on the area that you're in and what kind of people are around. And the best thing to do is if you really get in, want to get interested in amateur radio, try to go to a couple of local club meetings, quit being a desocialized dork, get out of your basement, and start socializing with these people. Because once you get on the air, everyone's really friendly. And once you have that license, I can tell you right now, before I had my license, everyone shunned me as the newbie, as, 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 as the beginner, as, as you know, the new poning piece of shit. And everyone, well, once I got my amateur radio license, usually it cost me up no more than fifteen bucks. Yeah, it's fifteen dollars to About take. 15 you, bucks. It's fifteen dollars to take your test, pass or fail. But if you go and you take your technician's test, which is the first level test, and you pass it, you get to take your what's the next one? Extra? General. A general. You get to take your general test for free as long as you take it right there, right when you take your uh, your technician license. Providing that there's a VE there that can give a general exam. A VE being a, a volunteer exam. examiner. Meaning the only way to get a license is to find a local amateur radio group that has a volunteer examiner. So you have to go and meet up with these people anyway. So again, be social. It's really not a complicated process. It's really fun. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. There's radio BBS. Yeah. Um, amateur radio operators have actually put repeaters in space in geosync orbit or out of geosync orbit. And it'll come over the crest of the earth and you can track them with a directional antenna. And the only way, you know, you can only get on at certain hours of the night. I mean, like the old the internet. Was, we can contact the International yeah. Space Station. I mean, if we if we had the proper antenna set up, hopefully in a future segment, we'll contact the International Space Station, or at least the BBS node, and try to actually spam them with the BSD URL. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, now there's a new technology called D-Star, where it's no longer analog; it's digital communication. So you can have 128k ISDN data through your actual amateur radio. It's it's no EVDO cell phone network, but still, it's data. I mean, there's just so much to this. I really don't know where to start. They have with uh, moon bounce. Yep. They also have competitions on how far you can shoot a signal out, like the Wi-Fi shootouts, but with amateur radio. People reflect their signal off the moon, or they'll actually, which sounds kind of hard to me, they'll reflect a signal off of uh, yeah, the I, comets or asteroids. I don't Asteroid. know. I, I I have heard of people actually waiting for full moons, as well as the the uh, the aurora borealis, the northern lights, and they'll actually get magnetic and solar wind reports to the actual magnetic. Um, predictions of the sun itself and how it will affect the ionosphere of the earth so they can reflect their radio wave off the ionosphere like a big reflector out to other parts of the world and it's it's actually some pretty crazy stuff and it's I don't know what else are we forgetting and we've got repeaters we got radio BBS which I mean it's a typical BBS you can leave messages chat all that stuff and email we got D-Star, we've got repeaters, which are like IRC networks. Uh, amateur TV. Ah, yeah, there's also Amateur TV. Um, I don't know exactly what you could put on Amateur TV. we got to look into that. But if you got a, ca a cable TV that has a manual tune, channel, I think, 59 to 61, something like that, it actually falls in the exact lines of Amateur Radio TV. Then you've got Slow Scan TV, um, and you've got Radio TTY, 
You've got PSK digital communication. Like PSK is uh, a binary way when you can't use voice. Now the reason for having, having your amateur radio license is so you legally know what frequencies you're allowed to operate in under what power output. And uh, it turns out that under my FCC ID, I can actually operate at a higher 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi frequency than most other people can. Typically out of the box, um, a home consumer unlicensed can only operate at 3 milliwatt total. I can operate at 1 watt, which is three times, a little bit more than three times the more powerful. Plus, not to mention, if you're actually involved in amateur radio emergency services, which set up emergency communications when the shit hits the fan, if you're ever in an emergency situation, you're the first person in the loop to know what's going on. We had a blackout a couple of years ago, and I turned on my radio scanner, I turned into the local amateur radio networks, and I knew that there was a blackout before the blackout knew that there was a blackout. And no one knew what was going on, no one had any communication, we had no phones, we had no cell phones, we had no fax, we had no internet. The only thing that we had were our two-way radios.